Good evening. I've been having a lot of letters about that very brilliant object in the eastern sky before dawn. And that is, in fact, the planet Venus. And I'll have more to say about that another time. But for now, I want to concentrate upon IRS, the infrared astronomical satellite launched last January and now going very happily around the Earth at a height of 550 miles. Now, as the name suggests, IRS is not concerned with visible light. It's concerned with longer wavelengths, infrared, which you can call heat if you like. And his first task was to carry out a mini-survey of the sky in an effort to detect new sources. And it did. It detected 8,000 of them. It then followed up with a much more comprehensive survey, and it collected 200,000 infrared sources, many of which were entirely new. And some of these were inside our solar system. In particular, IRS has now detected five comets. And the first of these, IRS Eraki Orgok, was a very interesting one indeed. It was visible with the naked eye. It was interesting, too, because it turned out to have a long, dusty tail, not visible in ordinary light. And that was due to particles of dusty material being warmed and expelled from the comet on its sunward side of the sun. Very interesting indeed. And the second periodical comet, Temple 2, turned out to have the same kind of tail. But now, IRS has discovered something which I think is much more interesting even than that. It's a curious thing. It's called 1983 TB, and it could have a cometary association. And at this stage, um, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Jim Emerson of Queen Mary College, who's been very deeply concerned with IRS since the beginning. Jim, what do you think this curious object is? Is it a comet, an asteroid, or a kind of a hybrid, or what? Well, we're really not sure, Patrick. Perhaps I'll explain why the problem arises. The object appears optically uh, to be rather like an asteroid. It's an Apollo asteroid. These are asteroids that cross the orbit of the Earth and go quite close to the Sun. In fact, they're shown on the right of this diagram. In fact, this is the orbit of Icarus which used to hold the record for coming closest to the sun, some 17 million miles. Well, one interesting thing about TB for a start is it taken the record away from Icarus because it comes within 9 million miles of the mm. sun. So that's interesting. But more interesting, really, is the fact that its orbit seems to be very similar to the orbit of the Geminid meteor stream. Now, astronomers have thought for some time that meteor streams, in fact, are the debris from comets that have gone past. And in many cases of many meteor streams, one knows the comet that is associated with the meteor stream. But for the Geminids, one didn't ever have any comet to go with them. And the fact that this object is in the same orbit immediately suggests that perhaps it's a, a burnt-out comet, perhaps, that has been by the sun so many times that all the frozen ices and dust in the outside of the comet have been boiled off by the sun, and what we're left with is the core, the remnant core of the comet, which will allow astronomers for the first time to really study the core of a comet, which is a very important uh, thing to be able to get at. Very interesting indeed. And what about these bands of zodiacal light, bands of dust that have been discovered by IRS? Well, of course, there's dust seen right throughout the solar system, perhaps debris from comets and from the formation of the solar system. This is known as the zodiacal light, and you can even see it optically on a very good sight, oh, at least, yeah. as the reflection from the dust particles. But IRS measures the emission from these particles. But the most surprising thing is, as you say, we've found these three bands of emission around the solar system. They're, in fact, perhaps better described as rings. One of them is in the plane of the solar system, and all three are about the distance of the asteroid belt. The central ring we interpret as asteroids that have collided with each other and ground up particles of dust whose infrared emission we see. The two bands that are about nine and nine degrees either side of the plane of the solar system. They were a bit more puzzled by. They're presumably dust particles as well, but we don't really know what they're doing out there. Uh, one of the possibilities is that a comet has collided with an asteroid, and this is the debris from that collision, but we have to work further on this interpretation. Yes, it's all very strange, isn't it? Now, let's go outside the solar system. Let's consider Vega, the very brilliant blue star, now almost overhead, and uh, that's already been known from our ass to be surrounded by particles which give the impression of being possibly a solar system in the process of making. Yes, well, that interpretation still holds good, and we're trying to look for more uh, Vega's in formation. Uh, we have a large number of candidates, but as yet the detailed work and observations and reduction of data to say if any of them really are like Vega has not yet been done, so we're hopeful. Well, what about other dust-covered objects in the galaxy? Plenty of them. Yes, indeed. Uh, from our position in the galaxy, which is shown on the diagram, we have difficulty seeing right through it. We're out near the edge of it, and the centre is about 30,000 light years away, the far edge about 75,000 light years away. And if we try and look optically, we often get intercepted by dust. In fact, if we take an optical photograph towards the centre of our galaxy, and here we see the centre of the galaxy marked with a cross, and the line is the plane of our galaxy, as seen from the Earth, 
we see a lot of stars, but they're not particularly concentrated around the plane of the galaxy. In fact, in the plane of the galaxy, it's rather dark. Star clouds in Sagittarius. Indeed, it's the, this is a star cloud in Sagittarius, and the reason we can't see stars in the plane of the galaxy is that nearby dust clouds are blotting out the light. Now, the beauty of observing in the infrared is you can see right through these, this dust, right through to the center of our galaxy, and this is the IRS image of exactly the same region. And you see it's strikingly different. Uh, we're seeing here not only to our center of our galaxy, but right beyond to the far edge of the galaxy, and we can see all sorts of objects in this picture. In particular, you'll see the yellowish object is the center of our galaxy, the green objects that are a bit off the plane are regions of ionized hydrogen surrounding very hot stars. The red objects are cooler dust. We see uh, all stars in all stages of their life in this kind of image, and there's a vast amount of data in here it will take a long time to interpret. In particular, if we go right towards the center of our galaxy, we can see another interesting phenomena, better on this picture, which is just a blow-up of the central portion with the colors slightly changed. These pictures are produced by the computer. They don't come directly from RS in this form. And we see here the center of our galaxy, that's the white uh, central bit surrounded by the red. But on the outer parts, we see the sort of wisps coming away from the galactic plane. And we do find wispy material all over the sky, so there's a possibility they aren't particularly to do with the center of our galaxy. But on the other hand, they give this sort of impression of being material that may be falling into or being ejected from the regions of the center of our galaxy. And we want to interpret and understand what's going on here. Well, uh, certainly the centre of the galaxy is the most mysterious place. But what happens if you look in the opposite direction? Well, if we look in the opposite direction, and let's take the constellation of Orion, uh, which is a well-known constellation almost in the direction of the galactic anticenter. Here we have the bright stars Alpha Orion, Betelgeuse, and Beta Orion, Rigel, uh, which is at the bottom right. And also this is the direction of the well-known Orion Nebula. Below the belt, yes. Below the belt. Uh, here, of course, we see the whole constellation. The sort of photographs that people normally show of the nebula are only a very small fraction of this photograph. We also note up at the top, drawn in red on the optical photograph, the red is colouring in of optical nebulosities that aren't seen on this plate very easily. There is a dust shell that's seen, and the other thing to notice about this picture is, on the whole, you see a few stars and dark regions, but it looks mostly like stellar objects. The infrared image, on the other hand, is strikingly different. Here it is. We see evidence for diffuse dust emission all over this region of the sky. In particular, in the southern region, south of the belt, where the Orion Nebula is, and indeed above it, the bright, uh, the bright bits in the red background are regions of intense current star formation. Um, young stars are forming and heating the dust around them, and there's a great big inferno of star formation going on here. A kind of stellar nursery, in fact. Uh, Orion has often been called a stellar nursery. That's a very good name, in fact. Now, if we go up north of the region where stars are born, born at the moment, or being born, we see a dust shell, the one that was displayed on the, overlaid on the optical photograph previously, emitting in infrared. This is dust that's been pushed out from around the parent star, which is Lambda Orion, or the star around, it, it, around which it was originally, by the pressure of the radiation from the star over time, and has been heating up, up and now lies in a shell outside Lambda Orion. And very recently, around Betelgeuse, just to the left, marked with an alpha there, we found a, a shell of dust emitted from a star in a much later stage of its evolution, but it seems to have been left behind as Betelgeuse moves through space, shedding dust in its trail. Right at the very top of the picture, we see more evidence of this infrared cirrus, the cloudy structure that is seen all over the sky, really. We interpret this as emission due to carbon grains in space, but the origin of some of it is, is, when one gets down to detailed interpretation, rather mysterious. Well, this Cirrus is quite fascinating, but uh, you do get dark clouds as well. Yes, well, of course, many of the things that we've been looking at so far we only see because we can see through dark clouds, but if we take a particular example of a nearby dark cloud in the southern hemisphere, the chameleon dark cloud, which is outlined uh, on this picture, we see that the IRS observations, which are just made in a little strip across the cloud for this particular picture at least, are marked by the circles which are numbered. And we see that the distribution of the infrared sources doesn't seem to take any notice of the fact there's a dark cloud there, which after all is what we'd expect, because they, we can mm. see through the dark cloud. But if you analyze the properties of the individual objects, we find three components. General stars in front of and behind the object that are perhaps not related to it. Then within the core of the cloud, near in fact those two optical emission nebulosities that one can see on the optical photograph, we find a number of stars that have quite recently formed, and perhaps more interestingly, near the edge of the cloud, in very small dust clouds, we find regions that look like the sort of objects that are going to form into stars. So we have fact, another example of that sort of thing 
in the cloud uh, known as Barnard 5, where we have an object that's going to form into something very much like our sun. It's an object which at the moment is about ten times more luminous than our sun, but is forming into a star of the mass of our sun, and this confirms theoretical predictions that before a star begins its life properly, it goes through a very over-luminous phase, and this object is arrowed here just to the left of the middle of the picture. So, in fact, Aras is telling us a great deal about the very early stages of stars. Indeed it is. It's telling us, uh, giving us a lot of new information about star formation. It'll take some time to assimilate into theoretical models. Well, from stellar births to stellar deaths. And, of course, when you talk about a stellar death, one thinks straight away of supernova outbursts and, above all, the Crab Nebula. Have you had a look at that? Yes, we certainly have had a look at the Crab. And most of the infrared emission coming from the crab is produced in the same processes as the optical and radio emission. It's high-energy electrons spiraling in magnetic fields. But in addition to that, we found an extra component, about a thousand times more uh, energy emitted per second than the sun emits, that seems to be due to heated dust in the remnant. Now, this may be dust that was swept up by the gas as it exploded from the central star, or, more interestingly, it may be dust that condensed out of the remnants of the supernova. Well, the crab is certainly full of surprises. But let's uh, leave our own galaxy now and let's look further afield. And, of course, the nearest of the major spiral galaxies is Andromeda, M31, just visible to the naked eye, not at a very favourable angle to us. But you can see the dust lanes there, and I imagine they're pretty significant in the infrared. Yes, indeed. Well, we can see into these dust lanes in the infrared, and in the iris image, which we see here at a slightly different orientation from the optical photograph, we see the emission is coming more broadly from the dust lanes in a ring. We can see that in more detail, the comparison, if we look at a black and white series of photographs. Um, here we see on the bottom left the optical photograph, where you can see the dust lanes, and they are in a sort of ring pattern. The optical mission will represent the stars that have formed in Andromeda, but have moved out from their parent dust and gas clouds, and we see them distributed in most places. Above that, on the top left of the diagram, we see the IRS map of the galaxy, which has a rather different sort of shape. In fact, the ring of the regions prominent in infrared emission is in fact correlates rather well with the dust lanes. These are dust embedded objects that have recently formed into stars and that in the next several tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, are going to peak out and turn into normal stars. If we then look to the right, or the bottom right, we see uh, the distribution of the gas out of which stars will form. And we notice that's also in a ring. That's consistent with the idea of this gas will form into stars, and some of it already has. That's what the RS image shows. Notice also there there's a lack of uh, atomic hydrogen near the centre of the galaxy. That is either because it may be molecular or it may be ionised, and also because some of the RS emission comes from late-type stars that aren't associated with the neutral hydrogen. The final image at the top right shows, in fact, the distribution of stars that have ended their life and exploded in supernovae and produce emission by the same sort of process as the crab. And this shows, again, that that is a sort of ring structure. So clearly star formation uh, has, in the past and uh, in the future, will probably take place in this ring around the Andromeda Nebula. Well, M31 is definitely bigger than our galaxy, but uh, do you think it's typical of a spiral galaxy? Well, no, I, it probably isn't. Um, our galaxy, you could characterise uh, the infrared properties of a galaxy by just the ratio of how much energy it emits in the infrared to how much it emits optically. For our galaxy, that ratio is about, as, uh, is about one. It gives off as, off as much energy in the optical region of the spectrum as in the infrared. For M31, it only gives off as tenth as much in the infrared, so it's actually a rather weak infrared galaxy. But we do, in fact, find a small fraction of galaxies. Our galaxy is probably fairly typical. We find a small fraction of galaxies, spirals, um, that are very, very strong infrared emitters. They're perhaps 50 times more uh, energy given off in the infrared than optically. Um, these, in fact, are confined to spirals. We find that elliptical galaxies uh, are really don't show up very much in the infrared at all, which is what we'd expect from astronomers of understanding of the kinds of material in elliptical galaxies. There isn't really any gas in elliptical galaxies out of which you could expect to form stars, whereas there is in spirals. So the RS uh, data has confirmed that association. If we go back to these galaxies that are particularly luminous, luminous in the infrared for their optical luminosity, for instance, as the, uh, one of them on this photograph here, uh, you see arrowed the rather unprominent object on this photograph. Uh, it is a galaxy. Uh, it, it's catalogued in a Russian catalogue of, uh, of galaxies. And we see it's a, an inconspicuous object. On the other hand, as the iris detectors scan across this same bit of sky, there is one very large signal, which we see in the middle of this photograph, this uh, arrowed, and there are three traces towards the bottom of the picture, 
with a large blip on them, and that is the iris detection of this object. And you can see, looking along those traces, there are no other objects of similar brightness seen in the infrared sky. So this object is very prominent in the infrared, but rather inconspicuous in the visible. Well, you discovered all manner of objects inside our galaxy, outside our galaxy, and even in the solar system. But it's fair to say, isn't it, Jim, that you've got a certain number of rather strong infrared sources detected by IRS, which don't seem to correlate with anything at all, as you can see visibly. That's true, and what's more, not only do they not correlate with anything we can see visually, that we can't find a, uh, a corresponding source in radio catalogues or x-ray catalogues or other kinds of wavelengths. Very strange. Very strange. Uh, we don't really know what these objects are because, well, we don't have anything to compare them with. We don't even know their distances. They could be anything from large bodies and the very outer confines of our solar system, say 200 times further away uh, than Pluto from our sun. They could be objects within our own galaxy. In fact, here we see a picture of the sort of thing that we get. We find that the IRS source is located within that ellipse, but on the optical photograph we just don't see anything at all. So we don't really have any good clue as to what's going on. One other possibility though, if we see the IRS image of the same region where the unidentified source is the red object up to the top left hand corner of the diagram, you'll see that it's embedded in a sort of a cirrus structure. This is in fact the same cirrus that I referred to before more examples of it. It is possible that these objects are just condensations in the cirrus in our galaxy. That's another explanation outside the solar system. Or indeed just dust embedded stars. And the third explanation is their extreme examples of these infrared starburst galaxies where a vast burst of star formation is gone, lots of infrared light is coming out, but optically we don't see anything because they're both dusty and also very far away. Well, Jim, Iris has been working now for a long time, and it should go on transmitting data until early January next year. And after that, it's obviously going to take you many years to analyse all the data you've got. What do you think are the most interesting things that may come out of it when you've really had time to look and examine all the data? Well, there are any number of things, particularly star formation and galaxies, and of course one wants to understand about active galaxies such as quasars, that we have collected rather little data on so far, or analysed rather little data on so far. One of the things, though, I think I should say is that there have been rumours in the press recently that Iris has discovered the tenth planet. Um, Iris should be capable of discovering the tenth planet, but we, we certainly haven't discovered it yet. We have a lot of data, and we have to look through it, and in particular, to, to prove that an object was a planet in our solar system, we have to see it move in an orbit, because otherwise we don't know how far away it is. And we've only recently acquired the data that would allow us to make that determination. So we're looking through the, the haystack of IRS data for the needle of the 10th planet, or indeed the 10th, 12th, 11th, all the extra planets there may be, but we've yet to find one. So, of course, that would be a very exciting discovery if we can pull out another planet in the solar system. Well, I very much hope it does come across, and I'm quite sure it really is there, although, as you say, it's going to be a very difficult thing to find. But um, Planet X or no Planet X, it's fair to say, isn't it, Jim, that IRS has been a tremendous success. Well, I think so, yes, and it's also been a very good example of international collaboration with our Dutch and American partners, and I think it's worked very well. Well, thank you very much, Jim, and we look forward to hearing more of the results when you've had time to analyse them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. So, IRAS is still going on the Earth, still transmitting. We'll do so until about January the 7th this coming year. But uh, before I go, there's one other thing I should mention. Uh, on the morning of December the 4th, there's going to be a partial eclipse of the sun when the moon will pass in, part in front of the sun and partly hide it. It's not going to be spectacular. You won't see the corona or the prominences or anything of that nature. It'll be worth watching, but do please be careful. Don't stare hard at it, and above all, don't look at it straight through any telescope or pair of binoculars, even if you use a dark glass, because, um, believe me, the partly eclipsed sun is just as dangerous as the uneclipsed sun. If you do have a telescope, project the sun onto a card by all means. Look at the eclipse, um, but do be careful. And so, until next time, from Jim and myself, good night. That edition of The Sky at Night will be shown again on Saturday at 3.25 on BBC Two.